Testing two. Testing two. La 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 la. I'm leaving tomorrow. I feel extremely unprepared. <laughs> uh, so now I'm kind of rushing to get everything together at the last minute, but sometimes that's the way things go. Uh, it's interesting. Been flip flopping between just in excited anticipation and and nervousness. But this is happening. This is actually happening. <laughs> When we look at SIT study abroad, our goal is to work with our universities and colleges within the United States of giving students the opportunity to explore the world. We have over 65 different programs in over 35 countries, and so our goal is for students to experience the world. My program is the Tanzania Wildlife Conservation and Ecology Program. My program is, of course, the Post-Conflict Transformation Program. My program is um, Development and Social Change. Hi, my name is Alex. In the fall of 2015, I journeyed to Ecuador as part of the SIT Comparative Ecology and Conservation Study Abroad Program. This program contains, includes more uh, field activity than a regular program, uh, university program. The program is based in Quito, and from Quito we go to these different places. Regardless of location or program focus, one thing you come to quickly find out when you study abroad is that so much of what you learn has nothing to do with your academic focus. That became apparent as soon as I arrived in South America. I gotta get the arrival. <laughs> Myself and 16 other students from all around the United States converged in Quito at the Otavalo Hawasi Hostel to begin our week-long orientation. So, first impressions of just like everything? Everything. Yeah. I, I'm just, it's hard for me to like, there's no absorbed thing right now. Yeah. But so far, everything seems pretty awesome. In your life, you know, can I help you? We come here for the purpose of learning about ecology, sustainability, and all of these things. When you're in the application process, those are the things you're thinking about, but you're not considering everything else that goes on. I think that it's easy to underestimate the impact of actually living, not just traveling, but living in another culture, living with a host family. They also, students lose a lot of their sense of independence and autonomy that they're used to in school. All of a sudden they kind of regress their, they're maybe, you know, 10 years old, so to speak. And yet they have to quickly adapt, adjust, grow up, and all of a sudden be doing an independent study project where they have to be adults again. So it's, it's a major learning curve. During orientation, we learned about the city and the country, politics, <laughs> traditions, gender roles, history, and more. And during all this, we were having to adapt to this new world, an overwhelming experience all in itself. But just as we started to feel like we were standing on solid ground, the time came for us to move out of the hostel and in with our host families. I know, I'm, I'm nervous, excited, a lot of things at once. <laughs> We got our letters from Lenore of our, our that our host family had written to us. Two hours before they picked us up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was a really interesting vibe of being like, we were all so excited to like be a part of a new family. My family, they didn't say a lot about uh, themselves in the letter. What is this that they gave us? Oh, oh that's just number Yeah. Your parents were writing. <laughs> 
This is my new place. Um, I'm settled in. I'm unpacked. It's nice to finally get all this stuff out of my bags and organize it. So, definitely happy to be here. Life is good. So having a host family was really important to us learning the culture and the language. Yeah, I feel like if we had not had host families and had, you know, either stayed in a hostel, it would have been a completely different experience the whole semester. You were just put in a situation where you had to learn how to communicate, like, no matter what your level of Spanish was. Yeah, bueno. Él te va a quedar muy pobre. Ensalada. Yeah, bueno. To live with a native family in another country brings the experience to an entirely different level. It's the difference between being a tourist and actually living somewhere. Part of the process was re like realizing like they're going on with their like daily lives. The program was all about us and our learning and our experience. It was just like this is daily life in Ecuador for an average family. And I get to witness it and try to be a part of it, I think was like really important. What's different about living with a native family is that you're thrown into that other world completely. All the subtle cultural differences you suddenly can't avoid. Food, hairstyles, transportation, mannerisms, everything cultural was different, and that makes for a challenge. Looking to learn more about the effect of novelty on personal experience, I spoke to some faculty back at my school, Wofford College. The problem of other minds is a really interesting problem in philosophy. One attempt to solve that problem is by inference. I know that my actions reflect certain mental states that you know, gave rise to my hand movements, gave rise to my words. I can infer from that that your hand movements, your words, your behaviors reflect mental states behind you. The problem though is that I'm inferring from a case of one, right? and that's a hasty generalization. I may think that my experiences or my behaviors in a certain situation are indicative of who I am. And it's not until I'm in a radically different situation that I can know whether those experiences are indicative of who I am or they're indicative of the situation I'm in. Anytime you're in an experience that takes you out of a comfort zone and places you somewhere fundamentally different, you experience personal growth. You have to change the way you do things, the way you think about things. You're confronted with certain unknowns and uncertainties. A lot of times you don't really understand what you're capable of until you are faced with those types of challenges. You know, without those hurdles, I don't think study abroad would be what it really ends up being for most students. And so um, it is such a, such a, um, a growth opportunity. And so I found myself wading waist deep through these novelties of experience. And with all these differences, unfamiliarity, and challenges, we began a new adventure of discovery, of people and places, and of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, so then we went on like three day trip to the Paramo. It was really cold. Very cold, <laughs> but beautiful, mm -hmm. but so cold. The summit on the right side. Your work activities are one of the most uh, enjoyed by students and teachers. 
because uh, making practical things in the field is uh, one of the most powerful tools in order to acquire that experience and that knowledge. I think that a lot of what students are actually studying here are things that they can actually see in person overseas. So there's that practical component, you know, where you can you can study the Mona Lisa, but you can actually see it in person as well. And so it adds another facet, another dimension. Opuestas o alternas? Opuestas. Alternas. Aquí está. Todo esto es una hoja, todo esto es otra hoja. Por eso eran compuestas, ¿sí? Ok. As aspiring ecologists, biologists, and environmentalists, it was incredible to learn about this unique ecosystem firsthand from experts on volcanology, botany, ornithology, and more. The Paramo is an ecosystem of extremes. High winds, strong UV exposure, a thinner atmosphere, and little precipitation all account for some incredible biological adaptations. And Casa Condor was an incredible base camp. The lodge is part of a community project founded on sustainability and outreach. The community runs an alpaca farm from which wool garments are made and sold. All proceeds go back to the community. The same goes for the money made by the hostel. It felt great to contribute to the livelihood of these kind, welcoming people. Furthermore, we were able to give back by planting native trees, like polylepis, alongside members of the community. Meanwhile, we were becoming much closer as a group. We were dropped off here and our support system was limited, if there at all. But then to like realize that you can actually get through that and that you can make the most out of your trip and then also just have this great support system that you just build an important part of study abroad is forming a support group. Building new and deep relationships is a part of the process that often goes overlooked. Traveling together was a great way to start forming friendships and a new support group. But after only three days, three days that seemed more like a week, it was time to head back to the more agreeable climate of Quito. Que tenga un bonito viaje y que Dios le cuide a todos ustedes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. We started on like a week of classes and then a week of expedition schedule. And so then our next excursion was Santa Lucia, the cloud forest. It was like a two hour hike to the top of this mountain where there was this really nice lodge resort. Resort. <laughs> yeah. Resort. It was. We are in cloud forest, AKA Bosque de Blada. We hiked up here. It took around two hours and a half. Yeah, so we go on hikes and we have been catching birds, nets, nest netting, nest some net. people call it. So you will hold mm -hmm. with one hand. We've been having little botany classes to learn about major plant species. It's, it's one main root and many, many secondary mm -hmm. roots. And insect orders. Specifically moths. With a light trap. You don't like moths. <laughs> Oh yeah, we had to take all of the moss off of a branch. 
So when you are looking at burn and having burn. Very exciting moment. And we dried out the moss in a pant leg. <laughs> <laughs> Although only about a hundred miles apart as the crow flies, Santa Lucia was like an entirely different planet than the Chimborazo region. Where Paramo is mostly open grassland, the cloud forest is a jungle with an incredible level of biodiversity and endemism. Our studies at Santa Lucia involve both lectures and a whole lot of field activities, some guided and some independent. Not long after our arrival, we began our CIPs, independent research projects that we developed in small groups. Well, my group for CIP is working with insects. They're all from primary forest right now, and we're up to 67. Nice. Science. Not on vertebrates. Very good. They're a good indicator of water quality, so we're going to compare the water quality of Site and the Amazon site. These projects were a challenge at times, but everyone enjoyed a break from sit-down lectures, and it was meaningful to work on projects that we designed ourselves. Tell me about the amphibian project. <laughs> we're about to go hike out in this weather down to a river that is 40 minutes away, right? Yes. To record um, frog calls at increasing distances from the river to see how species diversity changes. And we are taking along with us Noe, who is very knowledgeable about the forest so we won't get lost. Here, let's get a measurement on temperature and humidity. And temperature, 23 degrees Celsius, uh, humidity 98%. And all these studies tied back to one important thing. Study science, biological and ecological sciences, in order to apply to practical conservation. All the areas we travel to are facing severe threats in some way or another. This region of northwestern Ecuador is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. But it is greatly threatened by agriculture, hydroelectric projects, habitat destruction, and in particular, mining. From atop the beautiful Santa Lucia Reserve, we could scan across the landscape and see the scars of resource exploitation, much of it African palm oil and bananas. Estos hábitats están en mucho peligro, en mucho peligro, por eh, problemas de deforestación, mm -hmm. avance de la frontera agrícola. He visto cómo descubrimos especies nuevas y cómo esos mismos bosques, por falta de actividades de conservación, desaparecen en nuestros ojos. Cómo estos bosques son cortados para tener madera o simplemente para construir carreteras. Eh, ampliar carreteras y de esta forma destruimos estos sitios. However, this is not to say that all human impacts on the environment are negative. There are ways of living sustainably. And so we travel to a small town called Yungia to get a closer look at sustainable practices and community tourism. The Javier's just dropped us off. We're like, see ya. And we got to stay with rural homestay families, which was pretty cool. Well, it's we just got awesome. here. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's like pretty small and really cute. And yeah. it's the most amazing view. Their entire income is based on like um, ecotourism. Y de ahí también se viene la idea de hacer turismo. Mediante un trabajo voluntario que se lo conocen las comunidades como las mingas. Our family's cool. We don't know any names. There's a lot of confusion. I didn't know till this till like five minutes ago that this girl who's been running around the house was also a daughter who lived with us. Living with these people, if only for a few days, further reinforced my understanding that people and cultures around the world value things differently. It was clear that not everyone needs money to be happy and live a meaningful life. <laughs> And it's gonna be great. During our visit, we were able to help out with everyday work in the village. 
giving us a deeper look at different ways of life. And to come from different places, yet work and live together, was an incredibly valuable, eye-opening, human experience. We departed with our jars of marmalade, grateful for the hospitality shown towards us and the opportunity to relate to a different people and way of life. It was back to Quito for a week, then on to the Amazon. Packing for the Amazon excursion. We leave tomorrow, we'll be there for a week. Really excited. Um, what else do I need? So we set out on yet another adventure. This one hotter, sweatier, and more remote than anywhere we had yet to visit. Uh, take a picture Good question. Of me right now. How are you feeling? I'm so hot. <laughs> <laughs> In Limoncocha, a village named after the Green Lake it borders, we conducted wildlife surveys in a variety of habitats, went on night hikes, took a day trip to Parque Nacional Yasuni, and more. We're doing a lot of stuff. We're going to go on the lagoon in a boat, and we saw these baby monkeys. They weren't babies, but they were called baby leche, and they were adorable, and I want one. We watched birds this morning at 5.30, and we saw 23 species, Hello. and it was pretty fun, and then we got really rained on. It didn't take long before we began to notice some of the big picture interactions affecting this region. Three things really stood out to me. The forest, the people, and oil. We are often burdened by large numbers and mind-boggling facts surrounding the Amazonian deforestation and environmental threats. We hear about it on the news all the time and it becomes this casual issue, just a part of the way the world is. But the problem can't really be as simple as cutting down some trees, can it? We began to discuss the dynamic between these interactions, and the more I learned, the more overwhelmed I felt. It's a very convoluted, complicated, and decades-old issue. So Joe, what are we doing? Um, right now we're waiting at Repsol, which um, is a petroleum company that um, owns one of the gates and entrances to Yasuni National Park. Wait. Did you say a petroleum company owns the entrance to the national park? They do indeed. Interesting. I know, it is very interesting. <laughs> ironic, one might say. Yeah. Y el manejo de una desprotegida y el manejo del negocio más grande del Ecuador, que es el petróleo, entran en conflicto. ¿Quién manda? ¿Quién decide? In the 1960s, Texaco found large petroleum reserves in the Amazon. Once found, you have to get to the oil, so roads were built. Then, you have to get the oil, so people were hired. So the first thing that people of the oil company said, oh, we are offering jobs to everybody. And probably, if you have to see, but probably for six months, existing divisiones especiales en las compañías de petróleo que trabajan en relaciones comunitarias. Provocan desigualdad in these communities, they divide people so that they can't agree. They make the families fight among themselves. At the beginning, the oil company uh, was under strict government law on how to do their building, and they had to have monitoring. And I was fortunate enough to get the bid for doing monitoring for the insects in the canopy. The direct impact, because of following the rules that were set up, as far as I can tell, it had no impact whatsoever on the insect fauna, the canopy, but by opening the road, it allowed the, the indigenous people that uh, live in the area, the Warani, to shoot animals for bushmeat. Las autoridades, para estar en buena relación con la gente Warani, les han permitido a que los Warani puedan hacer cacería con armas. And they immediately went from their blow guns to real guns and that made them much more efficient hunters. And they took out over 121 kilometers, all of the bush meat within two to three kilometers of the road. Matan todo lo que pueden 
se llevan en las canoas y luego lo venden afuera. En los primeros tres años de mi proyecto, de uh, 94 a 96, uh, all the bush meat was gone from this road. Given roads with nowhere to go, given money with nowhere to spend it, given guns with no understanding of their consequences, the need for these things was imposed upon the people. But in order to explore these issues more completely, we had to venture out a little bit further, traveling to the heart of the affected region. Journeying to the Tiputini Biological Station through Repsol-controlled checkpoints by petroleum extraction facilities and along the Maxis Road gave us a close look at life surrounded and impacted by the oil companies. Then our visit at the Tiputini Reserve gave us a closer look at life less directly affected by these entities. We traveled by bus from Limancocha 15 minutes to an hour boat ride on the Yasuni River to a two-hour bus ride on the Maxis Road, to a two-hour boat ride on the Tiputini River, which took us to our final destination, one of the most remote places in the Amazon. Tiputini is a research station. Uh, it was built almost 20 years ago, and lots of groups come here as students and also researchers to work on several projects and several species, and that has helped us to understand uh, how the rainforests work. No tourism, no oil extraction, no deforestation, no roads, and no hunting. A place devoted entirely to understanding this natural region more in depth. Now firsthand we had the opportunity to observe these things, the role each part plays, and all the different interactions. Se puede aprender cosas de la naturaleza para aumentar nuestro conocimiento personal. El espacio donde la, el bosque se transforma en información científica y es donde los estudiantes son el, uh, el molde de la, de la ciencia. While in Tiputini, we conducted bird counts, night hikes, other biodiversity assessments, and continued with our CIPs. So, we are working on our frog comparative study and we're working on making our transect for tonight so what I have to do get down to the river and get a point and then go back uh, 90 meters away from the river. After comparison with the cloud forest we found that there was more overall diversity in the Amazon as we expected. However, frog diversity wasn't that variable in relation to the distance from the rivers. Rather, it was stratified vertically from the ground to the canopy. These informal types of investigations didn't lead to any scientific epiphanies. However, they were a critical part of our learning. It allowed us to experiment with and practice methodologies and get a first-hand look at these biological and ecological systems in a way not possible in the classroom. It was a fascinating and hugely important part of the study abroad experience for me. And not just our more structured work, but more fundamentally, just having the opportunity to be there. Like our other excursions, the Amazon came and went in the blink of an eye. Regarding our departure, I felt a little conflicted. It was sad to leave the constant adventure and marvel that is the Amazon, but I think we were all looking forward to retreating from the heat back in Quito. Then we go to the Galapagos, a lot of uh, marine 
Mind studies in the Galapagos, of course, the pollution. So we flew to um, Guayaquil and then over to we saw it. Oh, we flew, we flew to, to the Galapagos. <laughs> <laughs> What's what's the situation? When you hear the word Galapagos, the first thing you probably think of is Darwin. But the story starts well before the famous scientist. He believes that the first people that came to the islands were the Incas or pre-Inca cultures. And the Manta culture, which was a pre-Inca, they developed these huge rafts. Some of them were like about the size of our Nemo, but length. But the discovery of the islands is attributed to the Spaniards. But actually, it was just by pure luck, by pure mistake, this bishop, this guy from Panama, this Spanish guy that was traveling all the way to Callao and Lima, but the current drifted him here. Today, over 25,000 people inhabit the islands. Again, living with people in a different place offered a view into another way of life. The people were incredibly welcoming and enthusiastic to share their homes, food, and knowledge with us. The people of the Galapagos are good people, like most Ecuadorians, and we learned much from them. But settlement of the islands did have its negative consequences. Roughly 36 vertebrate species, 750 plant species, and 550 insect species have been introduced to the archipelago, seriously impacting the ecological structure of this unique area. Hay también problemas con las especies introducidas. El Parque Nacional ha tenido éxito con algunos planes de erradicación, pero faltan recursos y faltan gente en el Parque Nacional Galápagos para que puedan trabajar en proyectos de erradicación. Snorkeling daily and exploring inland areas of Isabella, we learned about the geology and history of the islands and the numerous issues impacting the archipelago, of which we saw many firsthand. But our short visit on Isabella came to a close and we took to the sea. I'm very jealous you guys are going on the boat. I know, I want to go We snorkeled with sea lions and penguins and it was incredible. Our group boarded the Nemo, and we set out, traveling around and visiting various islands in the archipelago. These islands, like all other places we'd visited so far, are threatened by a host of things. And spending every day out among the reefs, on the volcanoes, in the forests, all the while learning about the innumerable components of this complex system, we began to see how integrally connected everything is. The geology, the history, the people, the organisms, native and introduced. When you start to understand how sophisticated these systems are, and how fragile life on this planet is, you really start to develop a deep-seated appreciation for it all. What a privilege to experience this place, and gain a deeper understanding of how it works, what our impact is, and why it matters. a place where we can uh, discover and learn a lot about life itself, 
science, of course, and about ourselves as well. We got back from Galapagos. We have like everybody scrambling to get their yeah. ISP together in the field notebooks done yeah. in their yeah. final. And that was like two weeks. Like, two uh, weeks. With a break, with the holiday break. With the holiday break, oh, yeah. During our break, many of us traveled with our families for the Dia de los Difuntos, All Souls Day. My host mother Fanny and I traveled to her hometown of Salcedo. This was another opportunity to learn firsthand about Ecuadorian customs and traditions, like colada morada and wawas de pan. My family rented out a bakery for the morning to bake hundreds of made-from-scratch biscuits shaped like children in honor and celebration of the lives of their dead loved ones. Muy bonito, eso. In Spanish class in the States, you learn all about Latin American customs celebrating the dead. So it was really cool to experience the traditions in person. Following the holiday break, we had our final test in Quito. And then it was time to conduct our independent study projects. Nice. I see you have your tape measure. Yeah. You're prepared now? Apparently, I need it. Two months? Just and, a little end of bit. August. A little August. over two months at this stage, yeah. Does it seem like it's been that long? No, or it's longer. It's so fast. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> Wait, how do you... No, no it feels ever. like it's been longer, but it's gone by really fast. When I think back about like the hostel that first oh, week, so long does ago. that not seem like no, ages yeah. ago? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. really weird. But, really, but it went like, by really quickly. It went by so quickly because yeah, yeah, like, all of our excursions are done. Oh. I shouldn't be in this conversation. Enjoy the time. Oh, yeah. Make a great job. The students get to uh, make a uh, one month project by themselves. That's an independent uh, research. Javier, you're going to ask crew. Banyos, ISP. What about right? you, Lane? Are you excited? I'm excited. So we were off. First stop, Banyos. The situation is we're in Banyos right now. Banyos. There's five of us right now and two more that are doing ISPs in the Rio Pastaza Valley. After a night in the hostel, we split up and began the journey to our specific study areas. We were on our own now. Cool. En route to our final destination, Anik and I stayed a night in Mara with the family of Don Frankie Lugo, who we would stay with on the weekends. Well, this is where we're staying. It's a pretty cool place. They were incredibly gracious in sharing their home, food, and wisdom with us. Finally, the next day, Anik and I, along with Henry Sanchez and his mother, who we came to call Mamita Gloria, and who would be our cook for the following weeks, headed up to Ecominga's Rio Ansu Preserve. Ecominga was created in, those, in 2006, designed to protect endemic species with small ranges. The Rio Ansu is a very unique area, characterized by incredible limestone features and home to several species of rare orchids, uncommon fauna, and more. But it's not easy to get to. We finally made it. <laughs> That's good. It started raining right as soon as we got out of the truck. And as soon as we got here, it stopped raining, of course. But, <laughs> but it's incredible. It's so beautiful. I'm so excited to start learning the trails of Santiago tomorrow. Over the next few weeks, Santiago, a park guard, became an important figure in our work and lives. We came to see that the reserve guards are the heroes of these protected areas and learning their story and getting to know them was incredible. We have four, five guards, four full-time ones and one half-time guard. Me llamo Santiago Alcalde. En Ecominga hacemos de limpiar lo que es senderos, acompañamos a estudiantes. Era agricultor y también cazador, que antes utilizaba la escopeta, pero ahora utilizo la cámara. Santiago would come to fill the role of guide, teacher, companion, and friend. He helped me find snakes and Anique find orchids. 
My project's focus was on an uncommon species of pit viper, Othrocophius microphthalmus, and things started off on a really good note. Fourth, Fourth day. day. I think it's going great. We found the orchids. We found the Bothocophius. Two of two, two of, of them. them. Your thing is always mojado. <laughs> we went swimming in the river in Rio Ansu, which was really fun. Yeah. It felt so good to be at least clean for ten minutes. Anique was characterizing the biotic and abiotic features where her orchids are found. Meanwhile, I was using camera traps to study the thermoregulatory and reproductive behavior of Bothrocophius. We found the, this snake yesterday, um, and it appears to be staying in this hole here. We had the Bushnell going all night, came back, put the GoPro up. I'm going to put this thermometer over here so we can see what this snake does as the temperature changes throughout the day. Every day, for most of the day, we were in the forest, looking for snakes and orchids, exploring and learning. The whole experience was so novel, so out of context from our normal lives. It was a new way of learning, that of complete independence and total immersion. It's important to do a good job in the selva. You learn a lot, you discover a lot of things for science, for you. Si es posible observarle, nosotros hemos colocado, por ejemplo, cámaras trampa y hemos observado ya no algunos animales muy interesantes. Studying the ecosystem and the many components within it, I saw again how fragile the system is. For instance, both Rocophius seem to rely on fallen trees and other canopy openings to let light reach the forest floor, allowing the snakes to raise their body temperature in order to carry out necessary processes like digestion and reproduction. And mature forests are essential for this to happen. As older trees accumulate sediment and epiphytes, large limbs become heavy and break off and entire trees fall over, opening the thick jungle canopy. Unfortunately, agriculture is expanding all throughout the range of this genus, replacing healthy primary forests with ecologically unproductive monocultures and thick closed canopy secondary forests. Entonces, hay problemas ya de deforestación. Mm -hmm. Se ven afectadas cientos de hectáreas, yo diría miles de hectáreas en todo el trayecto de esa vía. Part of biology, really. It's part of your job as a biologist to try to protect the things you care about because. The person who's studying the organism is the person who knows the most about it. Where do you start is, is right here. You know, if you, at the very minimum, you have to maintain forests where the species are. These forests are networks of life. At the most basic level, the same life that sustains us. So how can we better coexist? Does human progress require the exploitation and oftentimes total disruption of the natural world? These and many more were some of the questions running through my mind during that time. So, Anique left this week. She headed to Banos to work on her paper, and I stayed another week to keep looking for snakes. Um, then, here by myself, so kind of lacking people to talk to, but that's why I talked to my camera. <laughs> With Anique's departure and that of Santiago about the same time, myself, Mamita Gloria, and Francisco the Tortoise were all that was left. Being an extrovert, it was sometimes difficult working alone in the forest every day. I'm going out for a night down the river. Mamita Gloria has prepared me with provision for at least three nights. This time spent developing my project and working alone was a new challenge, but a valuable time of independent exploration. And when the time came to leave, I was again conflicted. My last time here coming to see Ansua. Taking down the camera now. In a couple of weeks I'll be leaving the career, so time's going quickly at this point, it feels like. And I was tired and a little lonely. I miss speaking English and my friends and family. But I felt a strong sense of purpose and fulfillment, a good bit of pride for what I had accomplished 
and a fondness for that intimate experience with the forest and my study animals, particularly on Sua. I'm packing up, leaving Sumac today. It's been a really great time here. Experiences and memories that will last a lifetime. Spending those weeks in the Selva focused my attention to how it all relates in this closed system, what our role is as humans, and what my role is as an individual. It wasn't and never is solely about the topic of investigation, snakes in my case. ISP was a time of discovery in many ways, and although my time in the forest was coming to an end, we still had almost a week left in Banos to summarize our findings. Writing the papers was labor-intensive and exhausting in its own right, but it was great to be back with friends and to be in such an awesome place. I got some fajita type. <laughs> so it's, it's weird going back. Yeah, it's weird going back and it's, I'm really excited to see everyone again, but it's, we've also been on our own with maybe one other person or it's kind of weird everyone had such different experiences this last month where up until ISP, we all kind of had more or less the same experience. We went to the same places, we were taking the same classes, but this past month we all just experienced something completely different from one another. A few more days in Quito, and I feel like yeah. we're already gone. I think it's gonna fly by. Yeah. I think this is gonna go by so fast, which is kind of it's sad. Really like sad, but also I'm very like I'm I'm, I'm really ready to go home. Yeah. Bad. Personally, I am like very much ready. I want to see my family and just like do all that. Um, but at the same time, it's going to suck having to say bye to everyone. Yeah. But just like that, we were back in Quito and on the bus one last time, headed to La Esperia for a short retreat before the end of the program. How was it seeing everybody again? Oh, it's so, so nice. Great. Yeah. yeah. I've missed the group a lot. So y ahora vamos a hacer dos presentaciones antes del almuerzo. Aquí el horario no es tan rígido, pero más o menos almuerzo como a la uno y cuarto. We all presented our ISPs, submitted our papers, and had some time to explore, relax, and enjoy each other's company. Ready? No. We were all emotionally confused as we headed down the stretch. It felt like preparing to leave another life. This crazy whirlwind of a life of adventure and discovery. Nature of mushrooms. Happy to go back in a little sad. That means that you really were part of life. A lot of students have a hard time transitioning back to the U.S., back to campus. Many of them have grown in ways that their peers have not. So it can be tough. I mean, we have, we have re-entry culture shock that is part of that. But before the group split up and started to go our separate ways, we got together for one more chat to look back on the semester and reflect on everything. How do you how do y'all feel about leaving? I like, thought tonight? I was gonna be more like equally like happy and sad, but now I'm just feeling more pushed on to the sad side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was sad, but at the same time, we all felt so fortunate to have had this incredible experience. All of our experiences here were so real. We were there doing it ourselves, and I'm finding that there's like a lot of really amazing things about differences between different cultures, but that everyone kind of connects on the same level. Everything we learned was validated by experience, and that was such a different way for me to learn, but I thought it was so valuable. The thing that I think that this semester did a really good job of doing was kind of exposing us to the other side of the story in a lot of ways, coming from the U.S where everything's kind of one way, and then going to a developing country where everything is just completely different. This is such a formative time in our lives. Like, we're learning so much. We're trying to figure out, like, what the world is and, like, what we want to do in the world. As we wrapped up our final discussion, most people were undoubtedly relieved to be done with me and my interviews. But that dreaded moment was upon us. It was time to say goodbye. 
and my time to leave would come sooner than I thought. Well, basically, I thought I was leaving Monday morning at 12.30 a.m., but it turns out I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 12.30 a.m., and I just found that out at 4 a.m., p.m., don't even know what time it is anymore. So then I had to like, scramble to pack all my things. It's like 8 o'clock now, and I'm about to leave. I'm just feeling very mentally, emotionally unprepared due to this premature departure. And I just don't even know what to think. It's going to be so crazy to jump back into that. And I know it's going to be fine, but it's just kind of, it's a little bit scary. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, three and a half months later, just a few months that felt like years, and I'd been opened up to a whole other world. A world of different people trying to just get by, of creatures doing the same, of new knowledge to juggle and sort out. A world of never ending problems, but a world of never ending hope. Some of the best things that I got from this semester was so many conversations with different people about world problems and like, is there hope? Is there no hope? Like, what can we do? How do we fit into this whole thing? The real work in a way begins when you go home. Decisions and how you're gonna live your life, what you're gonna do with your life, what's gonna make it worthwhile for you, what are you gonna work in? Being here for a period of time and seeing another way of, of being will impact those decisions. I really believe that now you are global citizens. So having the opportunity to study abroad, go back and take that knowledge back to your institution. The real way to experience life is to be doing things, to be active, to be doing things. And if you do them with other people and for other people, that's a sense of fulfillment in life that is unmatched. And so the world changes. It changes in small little increments that are the result of the work of individuals. Positive things tend to happen on a smaller scale. Individuals, small groups of people, and so how can you make a difference? You have to go out there and do something that advances a better world. Uh, there's a little hope, but I, I keep thinking about the past. There have been times when things really look bleak and they got better. And if people had taken care of the planet then, a little bit, to buy us time, uh, some species would be gone. Nunca será demasiado tarde. Things do change. And I like to think that, that every single student that goes back has the potential to raise the awareness of not just his or her life, but the people around them, and then you know, as a ripple effect. When we become more conscious, we strive to make a difference. Not everybody, but enough people. And I think that will continue. So I think there's hope. Let's hope so. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The semester was a whirlwind. An experience so rich and novel, so challenging yet so fun, so long but so short. To see so much suffering, struggling, destruction, and then happiness, love, energy, life, that which makes us all alike. Something worth fighting for. To cut to the fundamental questions, what can be done? How can we do it better? Why is it worth fighting for? The answers, they wait for you in some distant, unfamiliar territory, far away from your couch. So go, get after it, explore, discover, learn, live. So it was for me, and so it may be for you, once upon another lifetime. I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>
this time. <laughs> How does it feel to be back with a... Gabby, I just talk to me. Come on. What? How does it feel to be, see everybody again? Apparently they had a pet parrot who could speak and was like... Welcoming us. Welcoming us. Bienvenidos. I'm yeah. so thrilled. And then it fell in water and drowned. Today. He yeah. killed their parrot. He killed their parrot. But aside from that... Yeah. Everything's been really good. good. I yeah. also think that Javier's are getting a little tired of us. <laughs> Maybe you specifically, but... Probably. <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> My is... Special. Irrelevant. He's irrelevant. <laughs> Outside.